Hey everyone, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory, and I have to say that the AstroTech 115EDT is one of my favorite telescopes of, of all time, at least it is right now, and I currently use it as part of a mid-focal length rig where I pair it with the ASI 2600MM Pro monochrome camera, and um, I'm not making this as a technical video. I just want everybody to know that. This is rather, it's going to be more about the wonders of the cosmos that you can capture with this rig. And uh, we're going to look at the latest rendition of a nine panel mosaic that I'm working on in the constellation of Gemini. And uh, uh, my intent is to keep it fun, to keep it light, uh, entertaining, educational, what have you. If you're interested in the more technicals about this uh, of telescope, I will put a link to the playlist uh, uh, related to the AT115EDT below. Also, if you're interested in how I'm building this mosaic, and uh, I have a tutorial playlist as well where I have a uh, I've published two parts to a three-part series on mosaics, uh, at which you, I encourage you to take a look at. In the meantime, um, when you're down there, go ahead and subscribe. If you're into astronomy or all things astrophotography, uh, I think you'll enjoy the channel. You'll enjoy the community that's building here. And with that, why don't we dive into Gemini and take a tour of this mosaic? Okay, so let's start with the basics on Gemini. So Gemini is one of the... Um, uh, 12 zodiac constellations, which means it lies along the ecliptic, which is a lane through the sky, which our the planets of our solar system and, and the moon seem to travel through. And um, based on your birth date, you, we all belong to one of these constellations. I happen to uh, belong to Gemini, and uh, and 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 you can see Gemini here, and it sits in between uh, Cancer the Crab and and Taurus. But if we zoom in a bit, uh, we can see the constellation art itself, and and we see these twin brothers, and these twins are Castor and Pollux, who were known in mythology for their bravery and their adventures. And uh, there's a whole bunch of lore behind these two characters, and uh, in fact, all the constellations uh, for that matter. And and uh, it's always interesting to read up on that. I'm not going to do that today, but you can you can Google this, or there are a number of books that that deal with these subjects, and I think they're fascinating because it's it's history, it's ancient history. And uh, so so naturally, when we when we look at uh, Gemini, and we know that the lore relates to these two brothers, these these heroes. Um, uh, the two brightest stars take the names of these mythical figures, right? So Castor and Pollux. And uh, these are uh, historically famous navigational stars, by the way. Um, they've been guiding travelers and, uh, um, and sailors for ages. And uh, Gemini also has some really cool deep sky objects. And you just have to know where to look for them because it's, they don't have many of them, uh, but they do have a few really cool ones. And if we zoom in even further, and in fact, we focus right on the foot of Castor, we'll find some of the gems and the pun is intended there. So uh, I went ahead and I framed uh, uh, an image that captures a few of the coolest objects, I think, in Gemini. And this framing uh, does require a mosaic, which is a combination of nine individual stitched together images, you know, to create this one field uh, of view. And uh, I've gone ahead and I did some work on this mosaic uh, already, and I've published a couple videos that are uh, tutorials on how to, how to do this. Uh, how to do mosaics, uh, but you know what? I really, in this video, I don't. Want, I, I really want to talk more about the image itself. And after all, we spend so much time in this hobby on the technicals, and uh, and there's so much technical challenge that uh, it's not a surprise that we sometimes forget to you know stop and appreciate the beauty of of what it is that we've 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 captured. So I'll try to do a balanced presentation here, one that. Um, that, that lets us enjoy the image and at the same time, you know, shares a little bit of technical detail, but not overwhelming.
All right, hopefully everybody's gonna get something out of this video. So here's our image captured by the AT-115 EDT and the ASI 2600 MM Pro. It is absolutely incomplete, meaning very little data was used to create this mosaic. In fact, I only have about 30 minutes of luminance data and uh, perhaps I have um, 60 minutes of hydrogen alpha and then 30 minutes each of sulfur and oxygen. And uh, these filters, by the way, these are filters that, that, that we use to, uh, to isolate and capture details that, that we can't otherwise see. And uh, I, then I combined this data uh, to create a color image. And I, and I used a technique, which is uh, a, show, a show palette, which is uh, similar to what we would see with the Hub, Hubble and the Webb uh, Space Telescopes. So this image, there's over 241,000 detectable stars, and that's just the heel of Castor. And um, only a subset of these stars are considered to be part of Gemini. So let's just focus on some of those prominent stars, the ones that are visible to the naked eye, because those are the ones that often define the asterisms and, you know, and the constellation uh, itself. So... Um, these would be stars that are usually, you know, a magnitude 7 or, or lower. And when I say magnitude, uh, we're talking about uh, a measure of brightness of a star and other objects in the sky. And the lower the number, the brighter the object. So right here we have uh, what is called 2 gem, which is a double star with a magnitude of 6.85. And gem, in the naming, represents Gemini. And the number two simply indicates that it's the second star visible in the constellation. And that's relative to its RA, uh, its right ascension number. So if you can imagine for a moment, just imagine there was a line that kind of bisected the sky uh, above. And, uh, and if, as the Earth rotated, you observed Gemini moving across the sky and crossing that line. Um, two Gem is the second star in Gemini to cross that line. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's look at Gem three and Gem four. We're gonna we're gonna slide a a, 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 a bit over here, and those are double stars. Um, but Gem three. Uh, or three gem is a very special type of star and it's a pulsating variable star. So instead of it shining steadily like a light bulb at, at one brightness, it actually brightens and dims in a rhythmic pattern, um, like a heartbeat, like a cosmic heartbeat. And in fact, this star is actually expanding and contracting, which means its size and its brightness is changing over time, but with a regular uh, rhythm to it. So uh, three gem actually ranges in magnitude from 5.7 to 5.9. Now, gem four is a much dimmer uh, star, and that's a magnitude of 7.4. Now, if we head north to Gem 5, just above M35, uh, we see 5 Gem. And 5 Gem is, well, it's just a plain old star with a magnitude of uh, 5.8, and it's about 540 light years away. Now, 6 Gem, on the other hand, is another pulsating variable of a magnitude 6.5, and it's a whopping 5,500 light years away. That's 5,500 times 6 trillion miles, which is 33 quadrillion miles away. And uh, as a variable, its magnitude ranges between, let's call it 5.7 and 8.1. But that's a much wider spread in, in, vari in, in brightness variability than what we saw in 3GEM. Now, if we slide to the east a bit, we see our first name star, which is Propus. And uh, what was also once known as Tejat Prior. And uh, that's 7 gem. Um, but this is a magnitude 3.3 star, which means it's very visible. It's much brighter. Um, and it's also a variable and a double. Now, the name Propus has its Greek roots. And it means forward foot. And that is probably pretty appropriate considering it is in the foot of Castor. And uh, the name Tejat Prior is an older Arabic naming, 
uh, which is suggestive of its position relative to our next star, which is another named star, which is Tejat, and that is 13 Gem. And um, this uh, is in the northeastern portion of the mosaic, and it is another double pulsating variable. It's also the brightest star in our mosaic at a magnitude of about 2.85, and it's the fourth brightest star in the entire constellation of Gemini. You know, Tejat is Arabic, but we don't have a translation for the, for the word. What we do know is that Tej, you know, Tejat is a red giant, and it's about 1,100 times larger than our own sun. And as a red giant, that means it's dying, and it's destined to become probably a white dwarf, and, uh, and this guy's only about uh, 230 light years away. Okay, so uh, enough of these individual stars. Why don't we talk a little bit about star clusters? Sometimes groups of stars can be classified together as one object in a catalog. And uh, so there's a catalog called the Colander uh, Catalog, and I think uh, that uh, that has about 470, 471 entries in it. And one of those entries, Colander 89, is in our mosaic. Now, technically, it only includes um, uh, uh, 9 gem, 10 gem, 11 gem, and 12 gem. But I'm going to throw 8 gem in it as well. Um, I'm not sure why it wasn't included in, uh, uh, in the catalog originally. But uh, these are stars that are not bound to each other. You know, rather they are a, a visual grouping. Now, there are star clusters that are more like families or families of stars that they, they hang out together in space. And, uh, and they're also uh, related to each other and uh, uh, interact with each other. So think of it like this. Instead of uh, a, you know, stars being all alone, these are stars that gather in groups. Sometimes hundreds, even thousands of them gather. Uh, uh, and they're, they're just absolutely stunning and beautiful to image uh, with a good refractor. Uh, and if we shoot back down to the lower right area of the mosaic, we see M35. And M35 is what we call an open star cluster, which is a group of stars that form together from the same cloud of gas and the same dust. So they're like siblings. And, they're, uh, and M35 has at least a couple of hundred stars that, uh, that we attribute to the cluster. And uh, it's about 3,000 light years away. Now, these are mostly young stars. M35 is only about 110 million years old, and that's baby. We're talking baby age here. And, uh, and when I image this, when I continue to image this mosaic, and I'll use some broadband filters, RGB, red, green, and blue filters, uh, we'll, we'll see that this cluster will take on uh, a blue tinge to it because younger stars tend to be bluer. Now, just south of M35, we have another open cluster. This one's called NGC 2158, uh, a new general catalog. And this one, but this one appears to be very tightly bound. And it is. NGC 2158 is much further away from us. It's uh, about 15,000 light years away. And we estimate its age to be about 2 billion years old. So th these are older stars. And there are over 800 members in that star cluster. And given its apparent size and its density is much higher, we can tell. And due to its age, when we do the broadband uh, data for this mosaic, we will see that this, this cluster will take on a bit of a, a yellow, red, orange hue, uh, which is a wonderful contrast to the blue hue of M35. I've actually imaged this already um, with uh, the AT-115 EDT. I may have shared some of it in another video, but I will do an update to this mosaic as soon as I have broadband data, and that will make a very big difference in these stars, which are right now monochrome. But I did get some narrowband data, not a lot, but a decent amount of it, enough to reveal some very beautiful detail in IC-443, which is the Jellyfish Nebula. Now, the Jellyfish Nebula obviously gets its name from its appearance. It looks like a jellyfish, but it's a phenomenal example of a supernova remnant. And a supernova remnant is like, think of it as like a cosmic ghost. It's like the remains of a star that ended its life in a gigantic explosion. 
And uh, we call the, that event, uh, that end of star event, that explosive event, it's a supernova. And what that results in is like the outer layers of the star uh, are blasted away um, um, and it leaves behind a very hot glowing core uh, where the star once was. And this core it could be a neutron star, it could be even a black hole, but it is incredibly dense and powerful. And that material that gets blown off in the explosion forms this swirling, expanding cloud of gas, and uh, that's what we call the supernova remnant. Now, IC443 is uh, a, a, an excellent example of a supernova remnant, and it formed um, about 8,000 years ago. That was when that supernova event took place. And uh, so IC443 now glows faintly in the night sky, and uh, it should serve as a reminder of just how incredible our universe is. And um, this, this remnant is about 5,000 light years away from us, and scientists continue to study it uh, today to learn more about how stars live and die and how they uh, go about shaping um, the cosmos uh, around us. Now, just to the north of IC 443 is, a, is another nebula. It's called Sharplet, we, we, it, it, from the Sharpless Catalog 249. And this is an emission nebula. And this is actually about 5,200 light years away. It's further away than the supernova remnant. And though they seem to be connected visually, they're actually different objects. Um, uh, I, um, uh, um, Sharpless... Uh, um, 249 is an emission nebula and that's like a glowing cloud of gas and dust and it's but it's a place where new stars are born and the glowing is not happening because of an explosion um uh, what's happening here is that you know the hydrogen the helium and the and the, and the tiny dust particles all of these gases are coalescing and uh, compressing and they're forming very young hot stars in, you know, inside this nebulosity, and that, and and as these stars are forming, there's an intense ultraviolet radiation that's ionizing all the surrounding gla uh, gas and causing it to glow very brightly. So you're witnessing birth here, <laughs> which completely is the uh, 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 opposite of the death of IC443. Um, but a Sharpless 249 is just a beautiful example of an, an emission nebula. And uh, it images very well with the hydrogen alpha filter, by the way. And it's a lovely visual uh, extension and contradiction to IC443, the supernova remnant. And just like IC443, scientists continue to study this region because it is a nursery. And it's where we can learn more about the process of star formation and the evolution of, 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 of our galaxy. And so I think overall, this is just such an impressive mosaic, especially given the limited amount of data that I gathered so far. And I will say without hesitation that I absolutely love my AstroTech 115EDT, uh, especially in the pairing with the ASI 2600 uh, MM Pro camera. If anybody's thinking about this combination, you can feel good about it. It, is, it works really well with two inch filter. So look, I intend to continue shooting this mosaic over the next couple of months. I'm largely going to focus on more narrow band and um, I'm going to get at least an hour of data for each of the broadband channels as well, the RGB. And I just have to say what a beautiful image and uh, I had so much fun uh, building this mosaic and I look forward to sharing more with you guys. Okay, let's call that a wrap on the video. I hope you enjoyed the mosaic as much as I do. There's a lot more to come on this project, so please stay tuned. And the easiest way to do that is to subscribe. You subscribe, you'll get notified as soon as I publish content, which seems to be mm, a couple times a week. And uh, if you like astronomy and you like all things astrophotography, this is definitely the channel for you. And uh, for those who have already subscribed, thank you so much. And I do appreciate all the likes and the comments. It makes a big difference uh, for me. And with that, I will see all of you on the next video.